and gentlemen, please welcome the eighth president of Rice University, Dr. Reginald DeRoche. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here for what promises to be an insightful discussion between Baker Institute Director Ambassador David Satterfield and former Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice. Ambassador Satterfield was recently appointed by President Biden as Special Envoy for Humanitarian Assistance to the Middle East, and we are thrilled to have him back on campus and pleased that he can join us this evening. David, thank you for your leadership and service to the university. It's greatly appreciated. I am grateful for the work that David, the Baker Fellows, and the Baker staff do to provide meaningful and impactful policy analysis on the most critical challenges facing Texas, the U.S., and the world. I now have the honor of saying a few words about our distinguished guests who will be receiving the Baker Prize for Excellence in Leadership this afternoon. Condoleezza Rice is not only one of the most accomplished diplomats of her time, she is also an incredible human being who represents the very best of our nation. Rice comes from a modest home raised by a public school teacher and a Presbyterian minister in racially segregated Birmingham, Alabama. Rice is a person of many talents, a brilliant educator, a seasoned university leader, and a skilled pianist. It is fitting that we will honor her here at the Shepherd School, one of the top music schools in the world, given her musical talents. She is the Tad and Diane Taub Director of the Hoover Institution and a Thomas and Barbara Stevenson Senior Fellow on Public Policy at Stanford University. Rice served as Stanford's provost from 1993 to 1999, during which time she was the institution's chief budget and academic officer. She was the first female and youngest provost in the university's history. And as a former provost myself, I can say it's one of the most challenging and most important positions in higher education. History, of course, best remembers Rice for her roles during the difficult times after 9-11 attacks on New York City and Washington, D.C., when she was a crucial advisor to President George W. Bush and his national security advisor. She then succeeded Colin Powell as Secretary of State during Bush's second term, a role from which she forcefully advocated for democracy and human rights around the world. One of the things that we do share in common, in addition to having both serve as provosts, is our love for professional and college football. We were actually talking football in the back for the last 15 minutes. It is reported that she watches 14 to 15 games a week, during the season, of course, recording some of those games, and she was one of the inaugural members of the College Football Playoff Selection Committee, which has been my dream for many, many years. <laughs> so everyone, I am proud to introduce the recipient of the Baker Prize for Excellence in Leadership, a person of vision who believes that, as she once said, great leaders never accept the world as it was and always work for the world as it should be. It is a distinct honor to award the Baker Prize to Condoleezza Rice. Secretary Rice. Yes, Condi. Ambassador. Condi. Yes. <laughs> We're delighted to have you here at Rice uh, as a guest of the Baker Institute. And much has been said about your, your background, your extraordinary career. I'm going to turn first, not to foreign affairs, but to the United States, yes. to the State of the Union. Um, Reggie talked about your background, but if I can, I'll speak to a critical part of your background. You grew up in the deeply segregated South. One of your plays, playmates was killed in the Birmingham church bombing. I remember you telling me that your dad and his friends went to the end of your neighborhood street at night for the night riders who might come to attack the neighborhood. 
yet your faith and confidence in the perfectibility of an imperfect America and American society is extraordinary, and I've heard it firsthand. I've heard it overseas, I've heard it in the US. Well, the United States today faces a deep challenge over legitimacy of institutions, legitimacy of honest debate, the otherization of those who do not feel, think, or look like you do. And so, Conde, I ask you, what are your reflections? Do you still believe in that perfectibility of America? Well, let me say that um, the United States of America is an extraordinary experiment. I would dare say that when the founding fathers at the end of the 18th century had this idea about self-governance that many people thought, what were they thinking? But what they did was to create this extraordinary set of institutions through which, as Madison would say, the passions of men uh, could be carried out, that one's interests could be explored without violence, without uh, the family, and they, they put their faith in these kind of abstractions called institutions, constitutions, and, and rule of law, and the like. And so uh, the question is, uh, does that still exist? And I think we have to say that they were absolutely right, that those institutions not only exist, but they continue to govern us in critical ways. And so I'll just give you uh, one example. You mentioned uh, my time growing up in Birmingham. And by the way, I grew up in a kind of nice, middle-class family. My dad was a Presbyterian minister. He was a high school guidance counselor during the week. My mom was a school teacher. It was faith, family, and mm -hmm. education. And that's, that's the way that the community uh, thought of their kids. They wouldn't be sacrificed to what Birmingham was, was really the way that, uh, that we were brought up. Uh, but if you look at the long history of the United States, I'm going to just take you back to one moment in my own life, which uh, just every time I think about it, it reinforces my faith. So when you're, as you will remember, uh, David, when you're sworn in as Secretary of State, it is in the Franklin Room at the State Department, and there's just a huge portrait of Ben Franklin behind you. And um, as uh, I was standing there and the President was making some remarks, sorry, I was kind of distracted uh, at that moment. <laughs> I remember thinking, what would old Ben think of this? Here is this black woman taking an oath to the Constitution of the United States to protect and defend, sworn in by a Jewish woman Supreme Court Justice named Ruth Bader Ginsburg. What would he think of this? Now, he's my favorite founding father, so I'd like to think he would have liked it. But the most important thing is he would never have imagined it, and frankly, never would I have imagined it in segregating Birmingham or Ruth when she was trying to get her voice heard in law school. So yes, the progress continues. We are not perfect, but we keep working toward a more perfect union. And every time we've been thrown a curveball, we've managed somehow to go back to those institutions and to make them work. And so I think our challenge is to make sure that generate, and here we're at a university, generation after generation understands how extraordinary it is to have institutions like that. You referenced the university, the academic community, but I'll project beyond the campus to society as a whole. The debate today, and it's the first one, you see it at Stanford, we see it as well here. It's been on the national front pages for many, many months now of dialogue, freedom of speech, freedom of expression, incitement, where does one space stop and another begin? Yes. What, as director of the Public Policy Institute, as provost of Stanford, what do you think about this? Well, let's remember that the United States has probably the most absolutist notion of freedom of speech in the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, we believe that uh, if you uh, abridge free speech in any way, uh, short of yelling fire in a theater, uh, that you're in danger of losing one of the most important values of a democracy, which is that people can say and challenge. What, what really uh, is the, the authoritarian way? Well, you have somebody who tells you what to do, who tells you what's right, who tells you what to think, and if you dare to challenge that, then you're going to end up in the gulag someplace. Now, in democracy, we not only believe that free speech is something that we deserve, we believe that it is a better way 
to govern, and it's a better way for human beings uh, to, to get to good decisions. So as noisy as democracy is, as cacophonous as it is, uh, we actually do debate, and there is no authoritative way of thinking about something until we've debated it, decided it, taking it through our laws. So free speech is actually tied to the way that democracies have to function. As a result, we make fewer mistakes. So I'll give you uh, an example. Uh, China, uh, sometimes you know, I hear people with authoritarian envy, you know, they build great airports. Oh, look at their roads. Well, every time you think about that, just I want to just give you one, one child policy. Mm -hmm. One child policy, brutally enforced, and now 34 million Chinese men don't have mates, and now China is trying to get women to have children, which they're not doing. Right? That shows what happens when you don't have free debate of issues. It shows when, uh, what happens when people aren't able to speak their minds. Now, in a community, you can also have standards that say you are free to say what you wish to say. That's freedom of speech. We must have academic freedom. You are free to study what you wish to study, and you are free to do it in a way that rejects the orthodoxy. That's all right. In a community, we should also be teaching that we do want to be a place where everybody feels respected, where everybody can succeed, and that we have a community responsibility, each and every one of us, not for, not for Rice or Stanford to impose that, but as members of that community to try to uphold those sets of norms. And I, sometimes we think we get those confused. On the one hand, yes, free speech, academic freedom. On the other hand, is it wrong to say to our students, to our faculty, uh, could, we, could we try the golden rule here? Let's treat people as we would want to be treated. And oh, by the way, I say to my students all the time, uh, you know, you actually don't have a constitutional right not to be offended. And so, uh, you're on, you know. You're on risky ground <laughs> yeah. here. So, so if you're offended, how about you turn, before you organize yourself on White Plaza, which is our designated yeah. place to, to uh, protest, before you organize the university because you were offended, how about you turn to the person next to you and say, you know, that was offensive. And here's why. And let's talk about it. And let's understand where I'm coming from on this issue. And oh, by the way, then perhaps when you offend, somebody will give you the benefit of the doubt. So yes, free speech. Yes, academic freedom. As a community, we have to work hard to get to a set of norms about uh, being a place where everybody can succeed and everybody feels respected. Those principles that recommendation for practice. Is it, in your view, fundamentally challenged by populism, demagogic approaches to issues domestic yeah. or foreign? Or is this another passing phase in our long history? It is definitely challenged, and it has been challenged before. We've had uh, populist demagogues before in our history. Uh, it is certainly uh, a challenge in places like universities uh, mm -hmm. because uh, our students are young and perhaps they ha don't quite know the history and so forth. But it's more challenging today than it was in the past, and for one reason, and that's how we get our information. The way that we get our information today really does cause us to prefer to only speak to those who will confirm our own high opinion of ourselves. Uh, it causes us to speak to our tribe. And you can easily find your tribe now, because you can go to your bloggers, your websites, your cable news channel. You actually never have to engage with anybody who thinks differently. So now when you engage somebody who thinks differently, you think they're either stupid or venal. And so I think the challenge is greater now because we're living in these echo chambers. I'm going to date myself. Uh, when I was a kid, you know, uh, everybody either listened to the Huntley Brinkley Report, which is what my family did, to Walter Cronkite, or maybe to Har Howard K. Smith. A generation later, you would listen to Brokaw and Rather and Jennings. We pretty much heard the same stories yes. delivered in the same way. And so we had a kind of common understanding of what was going on around us in the world. 
Now, just listen to the opposing views up there, and you'll think, are we even hearing about the same world? Are we hearing about the same issues? Because now it has become very much in a, in a simple, in, in a way that I only listen to those who think they're, I say, again, I tell my students, uh, you know, look, if, you, if you're in a situation where everybody says amen to everything you say, how about you find other company? Mm -hmm. yeah, right. We've had fierce partisan political debates throughout our history, yes. preceding the Constitution, yes. after the Constitution, up to the war and post-war period. Not new at all, no. but instrumentalization not partisan differences, right. but instrumentalization of wedge issues seems to have become more and more a hallmark yes. Yes. of political debate, if not political structures. How do you deal with that? What's the answer? And there's no doubt we've been through it before. A friend of mine who's his historian says, uh, everything is unprecedented unless you know history. And so uh, a lot of this is actually not unprecedented. Uh, and, you know, politics was pretty personal. You know, Jefferson did circulate that uh, circular that said that Washington was senile. Uh, so uh, we've, we've been there. I do think, again, the way we get our information is part of it. And somehow we've gotten to the place that it's the politics now of jealousy and the politics of anger. It, it's actually not the politics of interest, right? My interest is in doing X, Y, or Z. Exactly. It's the politics of, first of all, my interest is in stopping you. And secondly, it's not just my interest, it's your moral failure that you don't agree with me. And so that is a different tone to the politics. It's a different framework for the politics than we've had in the past. And I know we've had extreme passions before in our politics. For goodness sakes, we had a civil war, so we had extreme passions. But uh, this is every issue gets framed in this way. Every issue, the more, the more extreme you are, the more liked you will get, and the more you will get on the evening news channels. And so there is a premium now on being as disagreeable as you possibly can. And I think that's what's coming through in our politics. Will we move beyond it? I, I think we have to move beyond it. And uh, you know, the American people are gonna have to start to say, uh, that's not career enhancing to behave that way. Now, one of the things that is concerning to me is that I'm seeing more and po more people leave politics because they just won't yeah. put up with it anymore. And that's a bad sign. But I say to my students and my, my I have three godsons, one of whom just finished Stanford a couple of years ago in political science, and he's very interested in politics. And I say to them, all right, you gotta take back your democracy. George Shultz used to wear a tie that said, democracy is not a spectator sport. So we can all sit here and complain about the fact that the extremes control the politics. We can sit here and complain about the fact that uh, those who are the loudest and the most disagreeable are getting elected. Or we can start to get involved again in grassroots politics. So what do I mean by that? Mm -hmm. uh, I tell my students, how about you go serve on a planning board, a planning commission someplace? Instead of going to work in the Congress, might you go and work in a mayor's office and see if you can make a difference there and learn the craft of actually engaging in politics and making a difference? Because uh, what I see happening instead is uh, a kind of pulling back from politics. I have students who come in and they're kind of embarrassed to say they actually would like to be engaged in politics. Or, and I say, That's you know, you have to be engaged mm -hmm. in politics. That's the way that we get changed. So somehow we've got to change the narrative about, uh, about what it means to be a citizen in a democracy. Your favorite Ben Franklin and his famous remark, what have you produced? What have you a produced? democracy, if you can keep if it. If you can keep it. If you, yes, can, if keep you can keep it. Keep it. Absolutely. Right. Let me turn to a specific issue, and it's very much alive in California. It's very much alive here in Texas which is immigration. And I mean the broad yes. issue yes. conceptually yes. of immigration yes. as it has been historically yes. understood by Americans. The here and now issue of structural approaches to immigration. Is this just too subsumed in this instrumentalized debate? Is there a way to move forward in a, a constructive, positive fashion? 
What do you think? Well, David, you know in the work that you're doing in the Middle East uh, that uh, when you're in a crisis, it's harder to see the big picture. And right now we have a crisis at the border. We do. And I fear until we find a way to deal with the border, it's going to be very hard to have a reasonable discussion about immigration. And I'm sad to say that because I am somebody who's actually very pro-immigration. You know that yes. about me. I, I believe that uh, immigrants are people who refresh us because maybe many of them understand better the possibilities of America than those who've lived here for a long, long time. I believe that we need uh, people to take jobs. And oh, by the way, we don't train enough engineers, although Rice is doing its part, I might say. Uh, but we don't, we don't train enough engineers. And so there's a reason that people are coming from places like India to fuel the knowledge-based revolution. If you look at uh, the founders of uh, many of the high-tech companies, they are immigrants. So I'm a great believer in uh, the power of immigration. Uh, I was sitting, sitting, uh, sitting next to, seated next to uh, Lee Kuan Yew once mm -hmm. at a dinner. And he out of the blue said, do you know why America will always lead? I said, no, not Prime Minister, why? He said, because you know, you might want to be a young uh, software engineer in Germany, you will never be German. You might want to be a young software engineer in China, you will never be Chinese. He said, but you can be American in one generation. He said, so people will always want to come to you because your concept of citizenship is an open one. It does not have a designation by blood. Now that's a powerful, powerful thing. But right now, we've lost control uh, in a legal sense of the border. And so I'm hoping that we can deal with that and then get back to some issues of comprehensive uh, immigration reform. I'm often asked, you know, do I have regrets about our time in office? And of course, if you're there, you have many. But one of them is uh, one that's perhaps not so well known. Uh, when George W. Bush was elected, and Vicente Fox was elected in mm -hmm. uh, Mexico before they were inaugurated. They bet in Dallas. And they had a whole plan for how to deal with immigration, what Mexico would do, what the United States would do. And uh, they were going forward this. And on September 8th, Vicente Fox came to the White House in the first state visit. On September 11th, America's right. attention went the other way. Yes. And it was not until 2007 that we got an immigration bill, which was favored by Teddy Kennedy, John McCain, John Kyle, and George W. Bush, and it failed by one vote, by one vote. And so I think to myself, where would we be today if we had been able to do that? Because it was an orderly way to deal with immigration. Right now, we're in a disorderly period, and I think this is gonna be a half hard conversation to have until the border is secured. Let's turn to foreign affairs. And it's not a huge leap from the discussion we've just been having about the State of yeah. the Union. Around the world, as you know well, and as I hear constantly, there's grave concern expressed about the direction of the United States. And it's not about Democrats or Republicans or individual personalities. It's about whether America is turning away not as a temporary phenomenon, but in a very deliberate and long-term sense from its post-World War II, not just engagement, yes. but leadership right. of the global right. order. Yes. Is there a world order still? Is there an American intent to preserve it? Do Americans still support that? Do they still want it? The order that we helped to bring about after World War II was pretty successful. And it had a, a really interesting concept, which was that uh, there needed to be a global commons. Mm -hmm. uh, the international economy, for instance, didn't have to be zero sum. Uh, the entire history of the international system had been, my growth was at your expense. I took resources at your right. expense. I had to go to war over resources. And the, the kind of uh, ultimate moment was the, the interwar period 
when currency manipulation and uh, violent conflict over resources and beggar thy neighbor trading policies led to a Great Depression and then to a war. And the Americans came and said, no, you know, we can do better than this. And spectacularly successful, all the way up through the integration of China into the economic aspects of that. The collapse of the Soviet Union, so that you could talk about uh, the ability to invest in Poland. So spectacularly, uh, spectacularly successful. But it's been challenged in three ways, and I think mm -hmm. it's breaking down. Please. The first is great power rivalry has reemerged. We thought we were done with great powers. End of history. At end of history. We thought we were, uh, that we were done with uh, territorial conquest. Well, Mr. Putin isn't done with territorial conquest. We thought we were done with claiming uh, international waters as your own. Well, Mr. Xi Jinping is not uh, done with claiming international waters as your own. We thought that we were through uh, using the Middle East as a playground for our tentacles. Iran is not done with that. And so unfortunately, great power rivalry has emerged again. And it is a rivalry, those three, that want to challenge American power and essentially want to end American, as they see it, dominance of the international system. That's why they're linked. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not that they are allies in the, in the kind of classical yeah. sense, but they are linked in their desire to see an end to American power. And we need to understand that they're linked. The second thing that, is, uh, that challenges it is this incredible technology that we have, of which I'm a great believer, but where for the first time, the technologies are not largely the government's uh, purview, the government's doing, the government's ownership. You have the private sector as a major player in the way the world is reshaping. And I don't think we know how to deal with that in our international yes. order. And the final is something that brings us back home. Globalization is actually not a policy, it's a fact. But globalization did have losers. And we have not really dealt with the fact that it had losers. In, in my classes at the Graduate School of Business, I will always encounter the following student. Born in Brazil, went to college at Oxford, first job was in Shanghai, now at the Graduate School of Business, next job will be in Dubai. Moves easily around the world. Mm. Global elites. Most people never move more than 25 miles from where they were born. Their prospects, their values, their beliefs can be different. And what have elites said to them? Oh, well, shut up. You can now get cheap goods because of what we're doing in China. And they're saying, uh, what happened to my job? And so whether it's the unemployed coal miner in West Virginia or the steel worker in Great Britain who understands that Brexit might be a good way to signal that, we haven't done a good job of dealing with people who lost. And to my mind, it says that the first repair work, if we're going to continue to play the role that you and I, David, would advocate for mm -hmm. the United States and the world, is to fix it here. And what does that mean? No more third graders who can't read. Uh, no more 19-year-olds who, uh, who have a lot of college debt and no usable skills. No more 35-year-olds who can't be retrained because they are absolutely the prey for populists who say, I'll tell you why you're not doing well. It's those elites. Yes. I'll tell you why you're not doing well. It's the tech companies. It's the and they listen. Someone's to blame, and I'm going to tell you who it is. Yes. Yes. Exactly. Because you mentioned the otherization. We all know that one of the biggest reasons for the change in, in the economy and prospects is actually automation and technology. But bots don't make a good other. They don't. You have to have a human other. And this politics of jealousy this politics of desperation is something that we have to, to deal with. And the next step, the politics of rage. And then the politics of, of rage anger. and anger. And the more angry that I can make you at that other, the better. That's the problem that we have right now. And David, you and I both know uh, the, the Russian case pretty well. And, and I'll tell you a little story. So George H.W. Bush was talking to Gorbachev. And uh, I was his special assistant for Soviet affairs at that time. 
And uh, the president is explaining in his own way how, you see what happens in capitalism is somebody will found a company uh, seeking their own wealth, but then it'll employ lots of people and it'll benefit everybody. And Gorbachev's not buying it, right? He's just sitting there. So President Bush says to me, uh, are they translating this right? <laughs> I said, uh, Mr. President, the problem is uh, it doesn't translate. <laughs> and so Gorbachev says to him, here is why this will never work in the Soviet Union. He said there is a parable. Uh, the peasant finds Aladdin's lamp. The genie says to him, what would you like? He says, well, look at my neighbor. My neighbor has a brilliant harvest every year. His wife is beautiful and loves him. His children love him. He says, look at me. My harvest is a bust. My wife has left me. My children hate me. He says, oh, well, you would obviously like me to make you like him. He says, no, I want you to make him like me. Right? Mm -hmm. yeah. The politics of jealousy. And that is, uh, it was never America's want to say, what you have, you have at my expense. It was always, if my children aren't going to be wealthy, or if I'm not going to be wealthy, my children will be. And so I think we've lost that sense of upward mobility. We've lost that sense of everybody being able to succeed. Of I have a better life than my parents. Exactly. My children will have right. a better life That's than right. mine. And then you can understand why when somebody says, why are we giving money to Ukraine when we could be giving money, that people buy that argument. But I would challenge leaders who want to leave this country to recognize two things. The American people carry two contradictory thoughts in their heads at any given time. Haven't we done enough? Didn't we defeat the Soviet Union? Didn't we unify Germany? Uh, didn't we defeat Al Qaeda? Couldn't somebody else do it? And on the other side, we can't let big countries extinguish small countries. Mm -hmm. We can't watch Syrian babies choking on, on nerve gas. We can't watch people being beheaded. OK, if nobody else will do it, we'll do it. Now, an American leader can appeal to either of those. And if you want to appeal to the piece that says, we have this responsibility, whether it's fair or not, you can also remind the American people that three times that I can remember very recently in history, there was this date. 1917, but that war began in 1914, and we thought we could sit it out. And then 1941, but that war mm -hmm. began in 1938, 1939, and we thought we could sit it out. And then in 2001, we thought it would happen out yes. there. And then they ended up at the Pentagon, and in uh, Washington, D.C., and in a field in Pennsylvania. We have never been able to sit it out. It's only been a matter of when did we recognize that we had to take responsibility. But the seductive appeal of America first. Yes. My bridge, my highway should be repaired before Ukraine gets more support. And Ukraine substitutes for a long list a of long countries list. and campaigns. Yes. How do you, as an educator, as a public policy institute head, address this? Well, you start with what's the alternative? Right? It's, the alternative isn't everybody sits back and takes care of their own business. The alternative is China and Russia dominate the international system. Do you really want that? Mm -hmm. And uh, I was recently talking to a group of, of senators, and uh, I was explaining why uh, they shouldn't think of China and uh, the money for Taiwan and money for Ukraine as separable. And I simply said, uh, I would not want to be the American president uh, who has to explain to the American people when Xi Jinping and Vladimir Putin are on their victory tour, having defeated NATO, that, uh, oh, by the way, we could have stopped that. The Ukrainians only wanted money. They didn't want boots on the ground, and we didn't. And now American power has been rolled back, and who is in its place? Because the, uh, the tendency is to think that the alternative to American power is kind of everybody minds their own business and maybe it all works. No, the alternative to American power is people who don't share our values and don't share our interests. And I think it has to be made quite starkly that way. Uh, you have to talk to people about it. Uh, you know, when George Marshall uh, wanted to sell the Marshall Plan, you know, he got on a train. He went all over the country and he talked to people about why it was important to rebuild these countries, including why it was important to rebuild our former enemies. Now, can you imagine that conversation? Oh, let's rebuild Japan after what they did. 
oh, let's rebuild Germany after what they did. So it can be done, but you have to engage the argument. Soviet Union, 90 to 91, Eastern Europe, 88, 89. We, all of us, watched or listened to the BBC overseas yeah. reporting events that in our lifetimes, you and I, never we never thought yeah. we would see. Right. The wall down, yes. Eastern oh. Europe free, yes. and then the end of the Soviet Union. Yes. Did we make wrong assumptions at that time with respect to Soviet Union transformation into Russian Federation, the newly independent states? What are your reflections back on that moment as you project forward to today? Well, the most important is that uh, Vladimir Putin has created a narrative now that when the Soviet Union collapsed, and from his point of view, the Russian Empire collapsed, because I'll, I'll tell you, I was sitting with him once, and he told me, Condi, you know us. Russia's only been great when it's been ruled by great men, like Alexander II and Peter the Great, right? <laughs> not, not Catherine, she was a woman, uh, and, uh, and, and not Lenin and Stalin. So this was oh, about, no, this is about the Russian yeah. Empire, yes. right? So he now has this narrative, we tried to encircle them, we tried to make them weak, and unfortunately, I read this in some Western uh, academic literature. And, uh, you know, expanding NATO was to make the Soviet weak. He, in eight years, he never mentioned the expansion of NATO. So this is now his narrative, and we have to say it is absolutely the case that every American president, George H.W. Bush, Bill Clinton, uh, George W. Bush, Barack Obama, tried to integrate Russia yes. into the international system. We so wanted Russia to succeed. Now, did we make mistakes in, in trying to help? Yes, uh, one of the mistakes that I think we made is that uh, so-called shock therapy, trying to turn an economy that had had no private enterprise mm -hmm. into one that was privately owned practically overnight was a mistake. 50% of Russian citizens uh, dropped below the poverty line practically overnight. And so maybe if we had uh, been a little less uh, a little bit more humble about what we knew about doing this. We wouldn't have given them so much advice, but a uh, bad advice. But I, I actually think the real culprit here is Boris Yeltsin, um, who didn't allow the institutions to mature. He ruled by decree, and then he chose a KGB officer named Vladimir Putin, who most people believe that the reason he chose Vladimir Putin was Vladimir Putin promised to protect the ill-gotten gains of the Yeltsin family. And so uh, we can say we made some mistakes, but uh, I think this is on Russia. And what should we do as a strategic approach today, 2024, in managing this challenge, the challenge of Putin, the Russian revanchism yeah. that's underway? Well, the first thing is we can't let Ukraine lose. <laughs> Uh, if Vladimir Putin, uh, and, and in some ways he's already lost, you know, do you know that they went to, uh, on, when they invaded, they had five days provisions and their dress uniforms for the parade in Kiev. Yes. So they've in a sense already lost. They haven't in two years been able to overthrow that government. And so we have to help the Ukrainians figure out what it means to be uh, secure, prosperous, yes. and, and independent. And, and that will defeat Vladimir Putin. The second thing that will defeat Vladimir Putin is that Russia is sinking. I know that we haven't had the immediate impact on the economy that we thought we would, but just take something that I know uh, here in Texas is well understood, the, the oil business in Russia. So Russian oil fields, I was actually an oil company director um, a few years back, I was a Chevron director, and uh, one thing that you know about uh, certain oil fields is that they are remote and that they're difficult to reach. Uh, the Sakhalin Island, for instance, oil fields in Russia are extremely difficult to reach. It takes very sophisticated technology that only exists in the majors. Shell, uh, Exxon, BP, they're not going back. And so the Russian uh, oil and gas industry will, will die on the vine. And Vladimir Putin has seen one million Russians leave. The best and the brightest have left. And so this is a country that will, will go backwards. Now, 
I would be the first to say that may not be good for international stability. Yep. And so uh, one thing that we have to do is we have to separate the Russians from Putinism. Uh, when I first studied in the Soviet Union in 1979 as a graduate student, Soviet citizens looked at their feet. They didn't travel. They knew nothing of the outside world. In the 30 plus years since Gorbachev, they travel, they send their kids abroad to school. There's a whole generation of Russians that expect something different. We have to find a way to stay open to them. Uh, we have to have them in our universities, we, it, despite all that's going on, because Putin will, you know, actuarial tables eventually come to roost, and uh, uh, hopefully there will be a better Russia I, I underneath. I work in the Middle East where actuarial tables <laughs> seem to suspend themselves, to suspend themselves when it comes I to agree. elderly male leadership. Yes, absolutely. So yes. I'll take your word for yeah, it. <laughs> well, it's, it's only in the Middle East that that's the case. Yeah. <laughs> but let's go from that very significant challenge posed by Russia, which is admittedly a dying, literal dying yes. demographic, yes. a dying economy. Yes. To a rather different situation in China. Yeah. How do you confront the complex economic, political, and military challenge that China represents? You know, there are those who believe that uh, we made a big mistake when Deng Xiaoping wanted to enter the international economy and we said, come on in, because it was a country of, you know, a billion two or so at the time and the economy was roaring and we thought it was better to integrate them mm -hmm. than not. Uh, and we thought over time it would moderate their policies on intellectual property protection, uh, might even change their political system to a certain extent because the word was, well, you know, uh, you can't have both economic liberalization and political control. And for a while it was moving, not that the Communist Party was giving up, but for instance, you had a private sector, Alibaba and Tencent, mm -hmm. that was becoming quite powerful. China actually once led the world in startups for online education. So this happens through Jiang Zemin, through Hu Jintao, I can tell you they were actually very cooperative on things like North Korea, for mm. instance. Uh, we knew their military was growing underneath, uh, but it seemed to, with a little bit of discomfort, it was kind of working. Enter Xi Jinping. Xi Jinping is a Marxist-Leninist. He actually believes this stuff. He actually believes that the Communist Party is absolutely supreme. And oh, by the way, you remember that phrase, you cannot have both economic liberalization and political control? He says, thank you very much, I'll take political control. And that we hadn't counted on. And so China is actually uh, killing its own economic uh, development by uh, doing things like making sure that, that actually shutting down all of the online work. Uh, you know, Jack Ma didn't really just want to go be with his family, yes. really. Uh, and so slowly but surely, whether it is the demographic time bomb that they're sitting on, where thanks to the one child policy, they're going this way very rapidly, and whether it is zero COVID, now there was a great idea, didn't work out so well, and if you want to say you want to engage with foreign investors, you want foreign investors, don't raid Bain and Company's offices. So the Xi Jinping's policies are causing real problems for the Chinese economy. But we have to recognize that a lot of what is, they have in the economy is being turned toward their um, aggressive international behavior and through what they're calling civil military fusion that all of that technology is going to the PLA. And so that has caused us to finally wake up, realize that, uh, oh, you mean we had supply chains? Uh, we were dependent on, for, on China for rare earth minerals? Yes. Oh, you mean we lost our lead in, uh, in chip making, which we once invented actually, called Intel. Oh, you mean that's in a place called Taiwan in TSMC and isn't it kind of vulnerable? Oh, the pharma. Uh, you mean our supply chains were in China? And so we wake up and we think, uh, this wasn't the bargain. And so now, of course, in the United States, it's the, policy of dis it's the politics of disappointment. So of course, that's not a policy. But uh, we are decoupling from China in technology, and we will decouple. We have to meet the military challenge. 
But we have something wonderful going for us, which is that Xi Jinping's aggressive behavior has given us more allies and friends than we ever could have collected on our own. Whether it's the friendship with India, because they're looking across at China, the Philippines and Vietnam inviting American military bases, Australia saying, uh, we, Japan stepping up. So, and by the way, Vladimir Putin did the same thing, of course, with Look NATO, at right? NATO. Look at NATO. Who NATO would have thought? questing for a mission past its time. Exactly. And now Sweden. And Finland. Almost in. Uh, almost. They'll get there. But who would have thought it? Yeah. So we have to, George Schultz called gardening. We have to really garden these allies. We have to uh, avoid something we Americans have a tendency to do, loyalty test, right? Well, I mean, are you with us here? Or, you know, sometimes countries need a little room to pretend that they're doing things, but they'll do, it, do the right things because that's where their interests are. And so uh, if we manage this correctly, we can more than meet the challenge of China. I do have to say one other funny thing about China. We are decoupling in technology, but there are other as aspects where you can do business in China. And sure. you can, if you're in the entertainment business, so you'll remember when the Houston Rockets general manager said something about Hong Kong. And the Chinese said, we're gonna kick out the NBA. I called Adam Silver and I said, Adam, I can understand you have a particular interest. I have in a particular in interest in these sorts of things. So I called Adam Silver, I said, Adam, they're not gonna kick the NBA out. You know why? Because those young princelings are not gonna watch the Chinese national team play the Kazakh national team, right? They wanna watch LeBron and Steph and the like. So just be cool, it's gonna, and sure enough, the Chinese also want some integration into the international system, but unfortunately they want it on their own terms. We're gonna have to decide when it makes sense and when it doesn't. Quick question on, Taiwan, should we maintain ambiguity or be explicit in what we would do? I think ambiguity served us pretty well. Uh, I'm kind of old fashioned in that way. You know, the international system has these devices where the, the rhetoric doesn't really make sense, it doesn't add up. What you're basically doing is you're keeping something in place because you would otherwise have war. So our view has been, uh, we will help Taiwan defend itself. And the Chinese get to decide what that means. But as long as we have the, the presence and the military capability, uh, I think we're sending the right message. Now, uh, you don't want Taiwan to start talking independence, and I think this is gonna be a very good government. The Chinese, uh, by the way, didn't jump up and down when they got a very mm -hmm. uh, anti-Beijing uh, government. So uh, the other thing I'll say is that people often talk about the amphibious landing. They're, they're, Military people will tell you that a Chinese amphibious landing on Taiwan would be like D-Day times 100. But they have lots of other things that they can do that are kind of salami tactics. Cyber attacks, cutting underwater sea cables, seizing a, a, an island that's uninhabited but that Taiwan claims. So we have to watch this situation, uh, but I, I rather like that sometimes if you're too explicit, uh, you set red lines which is generally not a good thing to do in, in diplomacy. I, I have to, however, reluctantly turn now to the Middle East. Oh, well, David, you know more about the Middle East than any no, of us, so no. why don't you just uh, talk for a while? <laughs> the, uh, the challenge posed by Iran, which is, I think I can say with confidence, more complex more dangerous yes. to our interests, to broader interests, yes. international as well as regional, yes. than at any time in the past, both directly and through proxies. This is a major strategic challenge. Now we've tried different approaches. Yeah. We've tried twin pillars, dual containment. The Iraq strategy is the beginning right. of a change in the region. How do you assess what we do now? What has failed to, in my mind, is the attempt to give Iran room to enter the international system on terms that are acceptable to us. So um, I think it's a mistake to ever unfreeze a single Iranian asset because that regime has shown what they do with that money. Actually, a, a, it showed up in their budget, which was yep. the Iranian opposition actually released. 
and it was going to Hezbollah, and it was going to Hamas, and it was going to the, uh, to the Iraqi militias. So let's not do that again. Right? Let's just keep, keep their assets frozen. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, and now this is really easy for me to say, uh, you know, sitting out in Palo Alto, and I fully admit that, but uh, there are Iranian assets that are not on the Iranian side of the border. You know that. Um, I think you have to send a very strong signal to the Iranians through something that is kinetic. Uh, whether it is acknowledged or not, I leave to those in, in power. But uh, somebody needs to knock the Iranians back a little bit. I'll, I'll t tell you, they were, they're little dinghies when we were in office. Their little dinghies were running up to our ships and causing all kinds of problems. And President Bush sent one clear message to them through the Russians. You do understand, don't you, that an American captain has the right to fire if threatened, and they don't have to ask Washington. So tell your boys to back off. And they did. So this is not the bravest country in the world, actually. They do most of their damage through these tentacles where they can have some deniability for what they're doing. But I think it's probably time to send some kind of signal to Tehran. Iraq, where you and I both spent years of effort, is now in perhaps a more complex place yeah. in terms of strategic choices, yes. strategic options that, than ever during our tenure there. If you respond forcibly to what Iran is doing through the PMF, the Hashi Jashabi, its proxies in, in Iraq, you then invite a further pressure on the prime minister, who is, I think, a nationalist, I think and trying, nationalist. trying to carve a nationalist point. There's a balance here. You have to defend our interests and yeah. project back yeah. against this yeah. sense of yeah. we, Iran, have escalation yeah. dominance. Right. But there's a price to be paid, and Iraq is important. Iraq is important, uh, but the first thing is don't do it out of Iraq. And that's why I said perhaps you don't and limit yourself to these militias. Mm -hmm. uh, because if you send the message directly to Tehran instead, uh, and by their assets, you know that I mean Quds Force of assets course. and the like, right? Uh, you know, the killing of Soleimani was a really good thing. Um, and I think there are ways to do that, that uh, the Iraqis aren't involved. When you start using Iraqi territory for things or going after uh, assets that are on Iraqi territory, or th then I think you put the Iraqi uh, government do. in a very bad position. But you know, I, I th people will jump up and down, but I really doubt that the Iraqis are gonna care much if, if Quds Force, uh, force uh, assets start disappearing in other parts of the Middle East. And now we come to, to my conflict. Yeah. Which is um, another morphing of a much longer. Thank you for doing it. And if, well, yes. thank you. Yeah. No, the motto here is never volunteer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, it's, it's important. It's important. And it's important far beyond Israel, the Palestinians. It's important for the region as a whole. It's important for broader trans regional issues. All Hamas has to do to win is to survive. Yeah. All Israel has to do to lose is to not win. Mm -hmm. And therein lies the dilemma. Yes. And I assure you, you know well, in every Arab capital, starting with Ramallah, but then projecting out, the fear is Hamas will be yes. able to survive. Yes. And the impact of that on their futures, which were moving in a very different direction, they were a global, international direction. Let's do what makes a difference for our people right. instead of fixating right. endlessly on the past. Right. All of this gets flipped yeah. back again. What do you do? Uh, on, the, on the being flipped, I, I, I'm actually not so sure. Um, I think that a lot of the um, interest and incentives that led, for instance, the Saudis to do what oh, they've been course. doing are still there. Nothing has changed. And nothing has changed there. And uh, you know the Middle East. I wouldn't be surprised if all kinds of conversations are going on, let's say, under the covers about how to get back. Because um, Mohammed bin Salman, his, his thing is to modernize Saudi Arabia. And he can't do that with the current environment. Now, 
uh, they need a little bit of a horizon. They need to be able to say they, that there's something in it for the Palestinians. But I actually think that piece of it, I'm uh, not as concerned that it will completely roll back. It might pause for a bit, but I think in time. I am concerned about the, the, the point that you made about Israel and Hamas. Um, because there's nobody in the Arab world that wants Hamas to win this. And uh, I don't have a, a, don't know how well they're doing against some of the Hamas infrastructure. Uh, the leadership seems to be scattering around. Uh, but at some point, the Israelis are going to have to decide that they have done enough damage to Hamas to knock them back to say um, we are going to now also deny you fertile ground for this. So it, it doesn't mean, by the way, the Israelis are occupying Gaza, because you know I, I'm the one who negotiated the Israelis out of Gaza in 2005. And Sharon basically wanted out because he knew it wasn't defensible. Yeah. So you've got to find some way to sort of quiet Gaza. And then I think the Israelis can run counterterrorism operations uh, for a long time. But remember, this is a, you know this better than that, it's a small country, Israel. It needs its people back in the factories and in the industry. Its it, reservist call up has been a real strain on the economy. So they'll have to decide when enough is enough and go, I think, to something that looks more like counterterrorism than the kind of large scale uh, activities that they're engaged in now. Uh, hopefully sooner. Uh, rather than later. But I, I will just say one thing. What Hamas did on October 7th uh, was shocking. There will be a reckoning of how that could have happened. Uh, and that will take place within a democratic Israel. But the one thing that everybody needs to say is that what Hamas did on October 7th is not just unacceptable. It was a crime against humanity. And it really shouldn't have been hard to say on October 9th that raping women and uh, taking hostages and chopping up babies is a crime against humanity. And somehow we got all caught up in that, not the, the universities and others, all caught up in the, the rhetoric about both sides and so forth. Hamas has never represented the legitimate interest of the Palestinian people. In fact, they've done just the opposite. And I hope that people start to understand that from what has happened. And that, perhaps more than anything, might help to defeat Hamas. You need two things. You need to make sure they don't have the ability to do what they did on again. October 7th again. That they cannot deny governance, administration to the Palestinian people of Gaza, exactly. to anyone else right. because of their own claim to power. But you also need a political horizon that combats a Islamist extremist ideology and political ambition with something else and that as we grappled with yes and the sad thing is that is there hard. have been a couple times that you were almost there yes um, I remember very well that Ehud Olmert in November of 2008 offered the Palestinians something that they should have taken uh, we were already, uh, Barack Obama had already been uh, elected, and we told uh, Abbas, you know this, we told Abbas, come to Washington with uh, Ehud Olmert, deposit this yes. agreement or this, uh, this offer with President Bush. He will hand it to President Obama, and we can continue from there. And they didn't do it. And my sadness about the Palestinians is that, um, you know, the Arabs, have never really, uh, they, they care, but they've never really acted on behalf of the Palestinians. And it, in some ways, the United States has been more concerned than the region. And yet we've missed opportunity after opportunity. And one day, these people, the Palestinians are <coughs> entrepreneurial. They are uh, more tolerant, actually, than a lot of the Arab world. And uh, it's a pity that they've never had the leadership to accept uh, a deal that might have given them a state. I'm going to turn a moment to a question from a student, but I have a question for you. 2005, 2006, elections. Yes. Palestine, East Jerusalem, Gaza. We were strong advocates. Yes. It produced the Hamas victory. 
looking back these 16, 17 years. What are your reflections? I still believe that uh, the Palestinian Authority had no legitimacy if it didn't hold elections. And I remember a conversation with Abbas asking, could we, as an international system, because remember we had the quartet, right. which was Russia, the United States, the Europeans, and the UN. Could we, as an international system, demand that Hamas disarm first and mm -hmm. then run in the elections? And Abbas said, no, they won't run, and that will be a problem. Now, he's changed this narrative over time. Yes. We were the ones who wanted them to run. I, I would never have said, let armed people run. <laughs> and so that was probably the mistake, was to let the elections take place while they kept their militias intact. But the real problem wasn't that there were elections. It was that Fatah did such a lousy job of actually campaigning, of actually getting people to support them. They had a good story to tell, and they somehow didn't manage to tell it. I, will, I remember very well sitting at my desk that afternoon when the elections mm -hmm. were going on, and Liz Cheney, who was working on the Middle East, came in and she said, you know, our people on the ground say it looks like Hamas is winning. I thought, what? How can that be? Because everything we were hearing from intelligence and the polls and so forth was that Fatah would win. So we left, and sure enough, the next morning, we learned that Hamas had won. But we did something that was, I think, could have really made a difference. The quartet, again, Russia, Europe, uh, the United States, and, and uh, the UN, said to Hamas, if you will simply take the same oaths that Yasser Arafat did, that Israel has a right to exist, uh, that you'll renounce violence, we will recognize the you as a legitimate principles. government. The quartet principles and Hamas wouldn't do it. But that might have been a moment when uh, we might have gotten some of it. But I, I still stand by. Sometimes elections don't come out as you wish, but uh, if you believe in, in uh, elections, you have to hold them. I'll give you one student question, yes. which, which is a tough one. It would be a tough one for me. Yeah. I think it is for you. Let's look back at 2003 and the decision to invade Iraq yes. and overthrow Saddam. Yes. Looking back, as I do, I know you do, what are your thoughts? Yeah. Well, my first thought is that uh, what you know today cannot affect what you did yesterday. Right? And what we knew at that time was that this was a regime that was terrorizing the Middle East, including, by the way, uh, shooting at our aircraft on a daily basis in the so-called no-fly zones. Uh, we thought he was reconstituting his weapons of mass destruction. And by the way, weapons of mass destruction in Saddam were not a theoretical concept. He had had weapons of mass destruction. And if you read that they're buying large amounts of chlorine um, through military front companies, if Japan is buying large amounts of chlorine, then you probably think they're doing swimming pools. But if, uh, if, Iran, if Iraq is doing that, you think this is for nerve gas. So for a variety of reasons, I think we misread what was going on there. Now, uh, since we thought he was reconstituting and since he was the threat that he was and since he'd completely broken out of the constraints that had been putting, put on him in 1991, we faced a choice, uh, now or later and we decided now was better than later. You can argue with that choice, but after what we'd seen on September 11th when people told us that we didn't connect the dots, this time we connected the dots. Now, I would still say the Middle East is better off without Saddam Hussein, and the Iraqis were better off without Saddam Hussein. He put a million people in mass graves during the conflict with Iran. He put hundreds of thousands of his own people in mass graves. And we tried to give the Iraqis a chance to be self-governing. They, for the most part, tried to do that. And we do have, in Iraq, an American ally and friend. Would we do it all over again if we knew that their weapons of mass destruction were not fully reconstituted? That's a hard question to answer because, again, in the moment, you do what you know. The one thing that I would say that I would have, would have given me pause, is if I thought that the United States didn't have staying power in those places. And in some ways, even more so in Afghanistan. 
because uh, our impatience with people who are trying to find a way to a more decent life, our impatience with people who are coming out of tyranny and uh, don't quite get it right with their constitution and what they're trying to do, I ask myself, you know, uh, we of all people ought to be patient. This brings us back to our first thoughts, the, the first question mm -hmm. you asked me. How can the United States of America, that counted my ancestors of three-fifths of a man in the first constitution, and then realize that over a couple hundred years, we would finally get to a place that I could be Secretary of State, how can we be impatient with people who are just starting that journey? And when we've actually been patient, it's paid off. In Germany, where we turned one of the worst regimes in human history, defeated it, and now on that territory is a vibrant democracy that's a friend. In South Korea, a country that went through several military juntas before it found democracy, and is now a vibrant friend. When we've been patient, it's paid off. When we've been impatient and assumed that they should have gotten it right by now, we've both dishonored our own history of taking a long time to get to stable democracy and dishonored their sacrifice. Was it the experience of 88 to 91 decisive pivots of history that led us to believe everything could be done in a clean, yeah. decisive factor? Do you see a yeah. broader David, I don't think we here? ever thought it was going to be a clean, clean and decisive. You know, that's, that's a myth. Um, I, I remember you were, you were there. You, you know, we, we knew that uh, regimes that uh, are uh, cults of personality mm. don't have much underneath. Uh, we tried to allow for that by, uh, you know, th maybe there would be a civil service that would man the government and until we could get people. We had all kinds of ideas about how to make that transition. Uh, did we underestimate some things that might have helped us? It wasn't until 2005 that we made our peace with the tribes. Yes. And the tribes, it turns out, in Iraq were very powerful. And they became our allies, and that's how we eventually stabilized Iraq. So I would say it wasn't that we thought things would be easy, but maybe we didn't understand what I'll call the institutional landscape uh, completely. Right. I have one further student question for you, which is probably the hardest one you've been posed. Yes. Are the Broncos going to be in the Super Bowl? <laughs> Well, I first have to let you know, I am indeed a limited owner in the Broncos, but I, you have to understand this. My partners paid $4.65 billion for the Broncos. I own like four helmets, all right? So let's, let's be very clear about that. Of course they're going to be in the Super Bowl. I, I can't tell you exactly when, uh, but, uh, but uh, we're, we're working on it. We've got a great coach. We've got a wonderful fan base. and. Uh, we will get there. Uh, it's not much fun to be in the same uh, division with the Kansas City Chiefs, but uh, you know. Talk, talk to us about that. Yeah, yes. but, but we'll, we'll be there. We'll be Connie, back. thank you so much. Thank you.